do. I'm going to introduce uh, David Kyle Johnson, uh, Captain Admiral Professor. Uh, as I said, he did receive a, a promotion, not just with the epaulets. I'll come back to you, Paula. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> as well as um, uh, to a full professorship at King's College, right? All right. Congratulations. Congratulations. And for once, he's not talking about Christmas. All right. Very good. Please welcome Kyle Johnson. All right. Uh, you recall a few ago, a few times ago, I was. Th this is your tenth anniversary coming up. Is that that's right? Yeah. I've been doing this. I don't know, not yeah. quite ten years, but I, I was there close to your first year, I guess. Yeah. Right. Uh, so because I've been doing this for a while, and it's usually been in December. Uh, so uh, there are a number of talks that I've given. Obviously, a number of them have been on Christmas. Uh, if you weren't around during that time, I have a couple copies of the Christmas book back there uh, that I brought to send that I had hanging around the office. I figure I could uh, uh, offer them to you if you would uh, like, and I'll be happy to sign them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but that's not what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about science fiction and specifically the Orville. Interestingly, if your November talk was about storytelling and your January talk's about storytelling, this is kind of about the same thing. Uh, this is about the power of storytelling just in a particular uh, genre of science fiction. Um, this is something that I'm, I am working on now uh, because I have another course for the Great Courses that came out in, I guess it came out in June, maybe it was late March or late May, uh, <laughs> called Sci-Fi, spelled P-H-I, Science Fiction as Philosophy. P-H-I, get the pun? Right, okay. Um, so uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as, we go, as we go through. Um, I have a lecture on that, in, that involves the Orville uh, in, uh, in that series. Also, I brought that. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the middle of the talk. Uh, but what I'd like to talk about today, this is much more laid back. A lot, a lot of times my talks are, I don't know what the right word is, a little bit hard hitting. Uh, I'll talk about why the arguments for God don't work and talk about the history of Christmas and debunking a bunch of stuff about Christmas and that kind of stuff. This is going to be a lot more laid back and fun. Uh, we're going to look at a very, very um, new, fun, interesting science fiction show called The Orville. And I want to give a little kind of argument for why I think not only it's what science fiction does best, but it, it may be the most important science fiction on television right now. Uh, that might be kind of a hard case to make, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll hedge my bets a little bit at the end. Uh, but that's the kind of argument I want to give to you. If I'm wrong about that, it's not that big of a deal. We'll learn some kind of fun things about philosophy and science fiction uh, as we go through. Um, so I know my audience who's seen The Orville. Oh, you guys have a few? Okay, all right. Um, if you recall, a while back, Darren uh, wore a full-out Santa outfit, right, uh, to taunt me and tease me whenever I was giving a talk on Christmas, right? So since cosplay was clearly, right, like, allowed here, I decided to wear uh, my, or if you don't recognize it, right, if those who've seen it know, right, uh, you'll see some uniforms as we go through, right? But this is, uh, I kind of enjoy cosplaying a little bit. I don't get very, very many opportunities to do it, so thanks for indulging my nerdiness to allow me to wear my captain's uniform today. Uh, let's talk about the Orville um, and its relationship to philosophy. Philosophers have been writing science fiction stories to make philosophical points since before science or science fiction was even a thing. All right, so for example, uh, Plato's Ring of Gyges story uh, that tells a story of a man named Gyges who finds a ring that when he turns it a certain way, makes him invisible. Uh, motivates the argument of the Republic. Uh, essentially, uh, the debate is about whether or not, what Gyges does is essentially is able to usurp the king and marry his wife and take over the entire kingdom by being nefarious and naughty uh, in secret while he's invisible, right? But then because he can be visible and a nice person, he's revered as this wonderful person, but in reality, in secret, he's, hor he's horrible and awful. And the question that kind of motivates the entire Republic is, which way is it better to be? Is it better to be actually vicious but revered by the public as someone who is morally outstanding? Or is it better to be morally outstanding but be condemned by the public as someone who's horrible, right? And he uses the story of Gyges, who's able to do this because he has a ring that makes him invisible, to motivate that entire discussion. Um, Plato's cave allegory, uh, if you've ever heard of that. Oh, by the way, obviously, the ring of Gyges inspires Lord of the Rings, right? Like, a ring that makes you invisible. Um, Plato's cave allegory explains uh, Plato's metaphysics and uh, explains the value of knowledge. So most of you probably know Plato's cave allegory, right? You have the prisoners who are, oh, that, the laser pointer does not work on that. Yeah, interesting. Um, 
you have the prisoners locked in the cave, staring at shadows on the wall. They think the shadows are real. One of them discovers that, it, that it's not. They make their way out of the cave. They realize how the world really works. They think back on themselves, looking at the shadows and pity and say, oh, that's so horrible that I was like that, right? So, um, and it shows that it's better to be knowledgeable and know about the world rather than being fooled by shadows, fooled by, right? And so this is kind of a sci-fi kind of story that's used to make a philosophical point. Um, Descartes speculated about whether he was being deceived by an evil demon, right? And so uh, whether the, all, all of reality is a dream or whether he's being deceived uh, by a demon, that's kind of a sci-fi story. Laplace imagined a demon who could calculate the entire history of the universe mathematically via knowledge of the motions of atoms. So Laplace is thinking the world is deterministic and imagine this demon who could just do the calculations like it's a billiard table and figure out where everything's going to go, right? And so we, we have philosophers using kind of science fiction type stories to make philosophical points. Now, at this point, uh, the uber nerds might argue, wait a minute, all this crap is fantasy, right? This is speculative fiction. This isn't science fiction, right? Uh, Ring of Gaiji like Lord of the Rings isn't science fiction, it's fantasy. Demon stuff is usually involved in fantasy. This is not sci-fi. Fair enough, I grant you your point. So, to that, I answer, consider the second century Syrian philosopher, Lucian of Samasatoa, I said that wrong, sorry, who wrote the true history in the second century. This story involved an ocean-faring ship being whisked away by a whirlwind all the way to the moon. And protagonists find the moon populated by an all-male society, giant birds and cloud centaurs. The story involves a war between the armies of the societies that live on the moon and the armies that like the, the, the moon king essentially and the armies of the society that live on the sun and the sun king and they're warring over the colonization of the morning star. And the work is interestingly trying to make a philosophical point. It was intended to satirize the sophists and even some philosophers. Interestingly, the name itself, a true history, like it's such a ridiculous story, right? The ship goes out and gets whirlwind to the moon and da 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 da. Literally, the beginning of it says, like, all, like, literally, disclaimer, all of this is false. None of this really happened. And in this way, they're making fun of, kind of making fun of Socrates in a way. Only in this way is this actually a true history. They're making fun of, like, so Socrates' profession of, of, of knowledge, right, or his profession of ignorance, his whole argument is, like, the Delphi said that he was the wisest. Why is he the wisest? Because he's the only one that admits his ignorance, right? Everybody else thinks that they know something, but they don't. Socrates doesn't know anything either, but at least he admits it, right? This is a true history because unlike all the other mythologies out at the time, it's the only one that admits it's bullshit, <laughs> right? Like it's the one that openly admits none of this is actually true, right? All the other mythologies try to get you to trick you into believing that it's actually true when they're not. So it's the only true history in the same way that Socrates is the only one that's truly knowledgeable. Does that make sense? All right? So it's, it's clearly a sci-fi story, right? Like if we saw this today, we'd call it science fiction, and it's making a philosophical point. Um, there's, in the 1200s, an Islamic philosopher called, I'm going to mess it up, Ibn al-Nafas told a story, the Theologicus Adodactus, about a spontaneously created man named Camille found on an island that was brought into the world. The genesis of this man spontaneously created, envisions something like cloning. The ending of the story involves a vision of the future. And the work, in the work itself is like this big argument that Islam was compatible with empirical observation, that what Islam revealed could be reached by reason. Essentially, what Camille does is this kind of spontaneously generated person is goes out into the world and starts reasoning about it. And you know, absent the influence of culture and all that kind of stuff, he comes to all the same conclusions that the Islamists and stuff thought was actually true of, of the world, right? Uh, and so it's this, it's this way of making a philosophical argument in favor of Islam. Of course, I'm not going to agree with the arguments that are being made there, right? But the point is, this is clearly a very science fiction looking work way before science or science fiction is a thing that's making a philosophical argument, all right? Um, everybody tracking with me so far? Making sense? All right, a couple more examples. The philosopher Thomas More wrote the first utopian story about a utopian society called Utopia. That's actually where the name comes from. Uh, the first kind of a perfect society is described in Utopia, so everybody describes it that way. And he does this in 1515. Um, in the story, Hitholiday, uh, who is a Greek speaker of nonsense, that's what Hitholiday means, is Greek speaker of nonsense, um, or excuse me, in Greek it means speaker of nonsense, 
recounts his visit to the land of Utopia, who interestingly, which interestingly in Greek means good place and no place at the same time. So it's a no place, it doesn't really exist, but it's also the good place uh, that is kind of a perfect, what we would call utopia. Interestingly, if anyone's watching the show, The Good Place on NBC, right, which is a really great philosophical work, um, they are obviously playing on this as well, The Good Place, but also No Place, it doesn't really exist. Um, but Hitholiday uh, Hith recounts his visit to Utopia to Moore uh, and Giles in the story, who are also, like, Moore's the author, but he's also a character in the story. Uh, it's very intellectual. Utopia is very intellectual. It's communistic in a certain kind of way. Uh, everybody owns property in common. Everybody works. Uh, and, and this society in Utopia is implied to be superior in every way to European society. So he's making a philosophical argument about the way society should be organized. And it's a criticism of the way European society is organized at the time. Uh, um, well, at the time, right? That, that's, that's, the, that's the argument that he's making, right? About 100 years later, the philosopher Francis Bacon wrote The New Atlantis, right? And it had devices like submarines and microscopes, and so it's very sci-fi. Uh, it's also utopian in this way, where they're describing this kind of ideal society. Um, it has a very, as such, it has a very similar contrast and critique uh, of European society. So again, it's making a philosophical argument. Uh, it's, described, uh, a utopian, it's, it's described as a utopian society uh, on the island of Beth Ben Salem that is ruled by science. So Francis Bacon is one of the early scientists. He pioneers a number of scientific methods. This society in the New Atlantis is ruled by science in a certain kind of way. Um, the uh, House of Solomon uh, on uh, the New Atlantis is... Like, like, they perform experiments in the Bacon way, right? Like, and so he's like kind of this, giving this argument for the proper way to even do science. But it was also religious. The society was also religious, which could make the story act as a commentary on the compatibility of the role and the, and the role of compatibility of science and religion and the role of science in or religion in science and vice versa, right? So again, we have science fiction stories before science fiction is a thing, making philosophical arguments. Um, 1705, Daniel Defoe used a book that he wrote called The Consolidator uh, to poke fun at the politics and religion of his day. The protagonist visits the moon in a feather-covered rocket ship called The Consolidator uh, that lifts off from China. Uh, the Lunarians that they meet whenever they go to the moon have a special magnifying glasses, have special magnifying glasses that enable them to observe the Earth and reveal their inequities and the absurdities of human lives and governments. It's a very kind of pale blue dot kind of uh, view of what's going on in the Earth there. Um, and that's like the, the Chinese got this advanced technology from, the, from the, the Lunarians and that kind of stuff, right? But again, he's making a philosophical point, um, and he's doing so using science fiction. All of this is before Frankenstein, which is considered, usually considered the first work of science fiction. There's a, in The Great Courses has another course on science fiction taught by a literary professor, um, and he talks about the literature, like science fiction literature. My course talks about media. Um, but he, he argues that the first work of science fiction is Frankenstein, right? That's usually what's considered the first work. I'm arguing that, and a lot of people agree, that this, these should count. And note, the one big thing to note about them is they're all making philosophical points, right? So this is a very common thing for science fiction to do. Um, science fiction and philosophy today, today philosophers still use science fiction ideas and stories inside their works of philosophy to make philosophical points. So... Famous example, Robert Nozick has this uh, example called the experience machine, uh, where it's kind of like the matrix, right? You plug yourself in and it can give you any set of experiences that you want. And he asked this question of, would you plug into an experience machine that you could program to give you whatever set of experiences that you want for your entire lifetime? So it could, you could have whatever life you want, it would, it would give you that life. And would you trade life in the real world for a life in the experience machine? And he says most people would say no, and then that is evidence that most people aren't hedonists. It's a kind of refutation of hedonism, the idea that all that matters is pleasurable experiences. I give you a machine, they could program a bunch of pleasurable experiences into you, but you wouldn't want that kind of life because you value more than just pleasurable experiences. He argues that connection with reality is also something that's intrinsically valuable, not just pleasurable experiences. Making sense? You guys checking with me? Probably heard of this one before, right? The experience machine. Um, but science fiction, on the flip side, so philosophers are using science fiction. But on the flip side, science fiction writers are also using entire works of science fiction to make philosophical arguments. 
So this is why when the Great Courses asked me to do a science fiction and philosophy course, I insisted on entitling it sci-fi, science fiction as philosophy, not and philosophy. The idea is not to use science fiction to uh, illuminate philosophical ideas or to like, uh, oh, so uh, this particular, you know, uh, this particular uh, piece of science fiction raises, or raises questions or makes us think about this particular philosophical topic, so let's use that to introduce that topic and then we'll talk about that topic. No, in this course, I'm actually trying to look at works of science fiction and, try, and I try to figure out what arguments are they making? What point are they trying to make? What moral of the story is there? And then what kind of philosophical import is that? Is it a good argument, right? Uh, one of my favorite lectures uh, in the series is about Carl Sagan's Contact. Anybody seen Carl Sagan's Contact, right? It clearly is an argument that science and religion are compatible. From Carl Sagan, right? But he is arguing that science and religion are compatible in a certain kind of way in that film. And so in lecture five in The Great Courses, I examine exactly what that argument is, what the structure of that argument seems to be, given the content of that movie, and then I dig in and see whether or not the argument actually stands up. I actually argue that it doesn't, uh, that science and religion are not compatible in the way that the second thought. Um, so I have copies of the course to sell in the back. Um, here, I'll, I'll show you the lectures that, that, that are there uh, here in a moment. Um, the reason I did this, in my estimation, science fiction is too readily dismissed as juvenile escapism. It's something for little boys and they get their lightsabers out and pretend to be Luke Skywalker or whatever. It does not get the respect it deserves for its philosophical complexity, uh, for the fact that it often is philosophy. It's doing philosophy and actually is philosophy. Science fiction writers are making philosophical arguments. So as Kevin Kelly, founder of Wired Magazine once said, the science fiction authors of today are the people who are really wrestling with the great what if questions and grappling not just with the political possibilities, but questions like what does it mean to be human and where do we fit in the cosmos? I think we are all, I think they are doing all the heavy lifting of the philosophical questions even as they're doing chase scenes. Now, I think he's overestimating a little bit. They're doing all the heavy lifting. Uh, some of us are lifting our own weights here. Um, Others of, us for others, others of us are doing philosophy, philosophers obviously among, among them, right? But he is definitely right that this is what science fiction authors are trying to do. And so in my course, what I'm doing here, I keep forgetting my laser doesn't work. Um, you can't read these. Inception, The Matrix, The Adjustment Bureau, there's Contact, uh, Arrival, Interstellar, Doctor Who, Star Trek Next Generation, Dark City and Dollhouse, Westworld and AI Artificial Intelligence, Transcendence, 13th Floor, The Orville, which we'll talk about today, Orwell and Black Mirror. I'm actually editing a book on Black Mirror right now. Uh, Star Wars, Firefly and Blake 7, Starship Troopers, uh, Prime Directive from uh, Star Trek, Metropolis Elysium and uh, The Hunger Games Pan Am, uh, Snowpiercer, a great film, and Climate Change, one of my favorite lectures. Uh, Soylent Green, uh, Gattaca, The Handmaid's Tale, uh, Kubrick's 2001. This, among a bunch of others, are ones that I cover in the course. Um, so again, if you're interested, I've got uh, some copies to sell, uh, sell in the back. Uh, the DVDs, if you buy them from the Great Courses, are like 250 bucks or something like that. I'm selling them for 50. Um, the other one's like 20 bucks. Uh, I've got DVDs, or not DVDs, I've got CDs. I'm selling them for like 20 bucks. Um, so if you're interested, see me afterwards, blah, blah, blah. That's the end of my sales pitch. Done with that. Let's talk Orville, all right? Because what I think what's going on one of the best ways that science fiction does this is something I call cloaking bias to create cognitive dissonance. Now, what does this mean? Well, anybody any have questions so far? We good to go? I always like to stop and ask for questions. All right, okay, cool. Um, all right, so what does this mean? How does science fiction cloak bias to create cognitive dissonance? Well, we all have biases, obviously, that color our reactions to real-world events. We will decide what we think about the president's latest actions before we even know what it is, right? Uh, so I have an example. Does anybody know what this refers to? This picture down here on the bottom? The tan suit debate, right? Obama wore a tan suit instead of a dark suit one, once, and the right completely flipped the fuck out, right? Like, it was, it was insane, right? Uh, it was as if he had committed treason, right? Um, doesn't matter what Obama did, they would react in that way, right? Uh, and a lot of times, 
we'll treat Trump that way too. No matter what he does, we will react in a certain kind of negative way, right? Often deserved, right? But still, there is this bias that everyone has, uh, right, uh, that, that color our reactions to real world events. Well, what science fiction can do is cloak these biases by telling a story in a world that's so initially unfamiliar that we don't bring any preconceptions to it. Right? We just kind of read the story as it is, we evaluate the kind of facts of the story as they are, and we draw conclusions. So as the story is told, we draw conclusions about the events of the characters in the story, about who's good and who's bad, and who should have done what, and why they should have done it, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Then, at some point in the storytelling, we realize that this world that's being described is no different from our world after all, it's actually very, very similar. Some event or character is quite similar to some event or person in our world. Then, if the conclusion that we drew about that person is different than what we think about the analogous real-world person in the real world, we're faced with a kind of cognitive dissidence, right? The realization that we hold two contradictory beliefs, right? I really like person X, but then person Y in this story is just like person X and I don't like them, right? This is related to what uh, Darko uh, Southern called cognitive estrangement. Sorry about this. So, for example, if we realize that our non-biased conclusion, based in the science fiction, is actually more reliable because it's non-biased, this could actually cause us to change our views about the real world situation in particular. So, for example, Suppose a lifelong Republican loves Bush and how he handled 9-11. He liked the Patriot, Act. He, the Patriot Act. He liked the fact that Bush lied about WMDs as a justification to go in to get Saddam because the world's better off without Saddam. So he thought the lie was justifiable, right? So this is a really hardcore Bush fan, right? So he likes the Patriot Act. He likes all of that, right? He, need, he did what he needed to do to guarantee our safety, they said, right? This had been about in 2005, right? So then in 2005, he goes and watches Star Wars Episode 3, right? Uh, and he concludes that Palpatine, and this is Palpatine right here, evil Emperor Palpatine, concludes that Palpatine is an evil, manipulative tyrant, right? But then he realizes that Palpatine, lying to create a civil war and to thus justify a reorganization of the Republic into the Galactic Empire, for the sake of a safe and secure society, he says, oh, well, that's pretty similar to what Bush did, right? Except for Palpatine's supposed to be evil, right? Because of this, someone might actually start to rethink their approval of what Bush did. Does that make sense? All right? So that's what I call creating cognitive bias, or cloaking cognitive bias to, I'm sorry, cloaking bias to create cognitive dissonance. That's how it can actually lead to someone changing their mind. One of the big misconceptions. Yes, ma'am. Sam, I love Bush now. <laughs> so what? You're a fa you're a fan of Palpatine? Is that? <laughs> but compared to what we have. Oh no, no. Uh, yeah, I, I grant you that. Yeah, I, I got you. I got you there. Um, although uh, Trump hasn't started a war yet, but uh, okay. Um, so one of the big so so uh, Lucasfilm's chief creator officer John Knowles. So Lucasfilm's the one who makes Star Wars, right? One of the big misconceptions about science fiction is that it's escapist entertainment for kids that doesn't tackle any serious issues. But the best science fiction gives you an opportunity to explore philosophical and moral themes. There are often societal problems that are very emotionally loaded. We bring biases to them, but if you recast them in a science fiction setting and are thus looking at looking at a more novel situation, then you leave some preconceived notions behind and reevaluate it anew. This may cause you to rethink your position on the terrestrial version of that problem. He's talking about the same thing, right? So, making sense, everybody? Checking with me? All right. This is what sci-fi, I think, does best, this kind of cloaking bias to create cognitive diss dissidence. Um, and I think that the current show that seems to do this best is the Orville. And so what I want to do is present a little argument for why I think the Orville is the best science fiction on television now, because it does this best with the most topics that of, of philosophical and social import than anything else on television right now. So, let me introduce you to the Orville. It's produced by Seth MacFarlane, who's famous for Family Guy, uh, American Dad, a movie, uh, movie series called Teddy. Um, very funny, very irreverent. He's an atheist as well. 
Uh, it's clearly, the Orville is clearly inspired by Star Trek The Next Generation. I assume more people have start, seen Star Trek TNG, right? And you can see how the Orville looks very much like TNG, right? And it's a peaceful advanced federation called the Union that's exploring the galaxy in advanced sleek ships, right? So it's very TNG-like. It was actually first advertised as Spaceballs for Star Trek, right? So if you don't know Spaceballs, Spaceballs is just basically a Star Wars parody by Mel Brooks that's freaking hilarious. Um, and it's just kind of corny and funny and there's no philosophical import or anything like it. It's just kind of fun to watch, right? That's what the Orville was originally kind of looked like, was just this, you know, slapstick, we're going to make fun of Star Trek in the way that Spaceballs made fun of Star Wars. But it turned out that it was actually a lot more like MASH, or more we might even say a mashup of MASH and Star Trek The Next Generation. You have real characters in real stories that make actual, like the stories are making serious point, philosophical and social points, but you have a few gags and that kind of stuff thrown in. The Orville? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. We'll t we'll, we, you will see them in a minute. I'm going to give you a full introduction to the whole crew. Um, does that make sense? Right? So it's kind of like, it, it, we'll see why it's kind of like MASH here in a, min in a minute, right? But like MASH was definitely a comedy, but there was serious social commentary there as well, right? It is, it is criticized. I mean, like Frank Burns is, is, critic is a criticism of conservatives, and so is um, uh, Winchester, right? Uh, there, it's, it's an anti-war move, but it's funny along the way too, right? Orville's doing the same thing. They are making serious philosophical and social arguments, but you also get a, a few laughs along the way. It was actually panned by critics after one episode, but it was loved by audiences. So on Rotten Tomatoes, it has 21% with critics, but 93% among fans. It's the highest rated and most reviewed show on Rotten Tomatoes, all right? So, little argument, just, just to show you what I mean. So there's Star Trek TNG, all right? That's uh, Picard and Riker from Star Trek Next Generation. There's Hawkeye and Trapper from MASH. You combine these two things, and you get the Orville. <laughs> all right? Um, this is actually from the third episode here. Or Star Trek, the Android data from Star Trek TNG. This is an actually a little uh, a funny film that the, that the characters from MASH made where you have uh, Groucho Marx and the Marx Brothers. You combine them and you get the Orville. That's an actual frame from the show. Uh, Isaac is the android, uh, and he doesn't actually have eyes or ears. He doesn't have sensors on his body, so he sees out, and they're trying to teach him what a practical joke is. And so one of, the, one of his crewmates puts Mr. Potato, Mr. Potato said head stuff on him, and he walks around the ship with this stuff on his head, and he, it's a good practical joke, right? So... Again, you got comedy along the way, but you also have serious commentary. So let me introduce you to the crew, all right? Captain Ed Mercer. So Seth MacFarlane stars in his own uh, show that he's created. Uh, that's pretty common for Seth. Usually he does star in his show. He is a human. He's the captain of the Orville. My uniform is based on his. Uh, his command philosophy is inspired by Kermit the Frog. So he actually keeps a little puppet of Kermit on his desk. He's a good captain, but he fell, out, he fell apart after his wife cheated on him. So the show actually opens up with him walking in on his wife, wife cheating on him with an alien. Uh, and he kind of, you know, gets despondent after that and kind of falls apart. Um, a year later, he finally gets a command of a mid-level uh, you know, uh, vehicle called the Orville. Uh, he was initially granted command of a medieval exploratory vessel only because the planetary union was basically desperate. So this isn't the flagship of the Federation like in TNG. This is a mid-level kind of, you know, kind of, they're kind of low on the totem pole or whatever. Uh, um, they were desperate, so they gave him a captainship. So there's a picture of his wife uh, with Derulio, who uh, uh, she cheated on him with from the first episode. Um, and uh, you see the attraction? You like it? Um, yeah, whenever, uh, whenever that species gets sexually aroused, they spurt blue goo out of their, uh, out of their forehead. Uh, and so, um, you recognize? His wife is the second, is his first officer, right? So his ex-wife, right? So she's a human. She's the first officer. She's Ed's ex-wife. Essentially, they didn't have, nobody would, wanted to work with Ed, and she felt bad for what she had done, right, for cheating on him. Uh, and so as a favor to Ed, she volunteered to be a first officer so he could actually have a ship to command, right? But of course, the dynamics of having a husband or, you know, a divorced couple, right, in charge of a, a starship is pretty hilarious, Right, uh, and also, you know, there's there's lots of uh, there's lots of fodder there. So, um, so that's that's Kelly. 
uh, Kelly Grayson is uh, uh, the second officer. Lieutenant Commander Bordas is a Mockland. He is the ship's second officer. He, the Mocklands are an all-male species. There are no females uh, in Mockland society. Um, that is an interesting part of the story, and well, actually, this is going to come up later. His talents, he has absolutely no sense of humor. You can hardly really get him to laugh. He can eat almost anything. They discover this whenever he, they're like, oh, what is that? And they're like, oh, we're eating sushi. Can I try it? Yeah, and he picks up a whole clop of wasabi and just eats the whole thing. And they're like, what are you doing? And he doesn't affect him at all. And so they end up like, they can, he can eat cactuses, he can eat a bag of nails, right? Um, he can also sing, although we have not seen him do this yet. That's one of the, one of the, uh, 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 one of the uh, jokes of the show. But in an all-male society, of course, he has a husband named Clyden. So Clyden actually lives on the ship uh, there. And that's Clyden, and they are, they are married. So you have an all-male species um, with all-male couples in it as well, and that's going to come in a little bit later. Dr. Claire Finn, she is the chief medical officer. She is human as well. Um, she is the mother of two brats, Marcus and Ty, via artificial impreg impregnation. Uh, she's actually a very seasoned officer. She's one of the most experienced officers uh, on the ship uh, and is there kind of where she likes to be, where she is most needed, and she feels like she's most needed on the Orville. Wonderful character, and the boys are awful. The boys are just awful, which makes some, some, pretty, good, some pretty good stuff. Um, talked about Women, this is a really good example of a woman on the ship. Lieutenant Alara Catan. She is, a, she is not human, she is a Salean. And she is chief of security. She's a 23-year-old, tiny little girl that's in chief of security. Well, it turns out that Salaeans have evolved superhuman strength due to the extreme gravitational forces on their planet. And so she is very, very, very strong. Uh, it, usually Salaeans despise military service. They're kind of pacifists. So the Union fast-tracks those Salaeans who do sign up for service in the Union. Uh, and so at a very young age, she is chief of security on, uh, on the Orville. Um, she's one of my favorite characters. She's awesome. Isaac, he is a Kalanite. He is a complete, they are a complete artificially uh, created uh, life form or species. He is the chief science officer. All Kalanites are what are described as legendarily racist. What this means is, is he thinks his, superior, his species of artificial intelligence is superior to biological life forms. Um, despite him being very racist, Isaac is a very, very lovable character. Uh, he is on board to facilitate better relations between Kalon and the Union and to study humanoid behavior. As the series goes, he kind of gets rid of his racism. You, you have to watch uh, to see it. It'll, it'll, it's a continuing theme. Lieutenant Lamar is a human. His position is navigator. He's a major slacker. Uh, he hides his genius to evade responsibility. He loves drinking soda on the bridge. Um, but uh, he is the navigator. And then the, the, the uh, helmsman is Lieutenant Gordon Malloy, uh, supposedly the best in the fleet. Uh, he's another slacker. He kind of succeeds despite his stupidity. And he's also Ed's best friend. That's kind of how he got the spot. Um, they, needed a nav they needed a helmsman, and so that's how he got in. Okay, so there's the crew. Oh, one more. Yafit. Yafit is a gelatinum. That is the species name. He is basically a big pile of goo. Uh, he is an engineer, not chief engineer. He's just an engineer. He's really good at it, too, because he can basically just goo into any part of the ship. What happens when he gets sexually excited? Oh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, because he is in love with Dr. Finn, and he continually tries to... Uh, yes, he lusts for her, uh, and she does not like it. Uh, he plays the guitar... Um, he's a very good engineer because he can just goo into any kind of part of the ship and fix it in that way. Uh, he's voiced by Norm MacDonald, too, if you know who Norm MacDonald is. It's freaking hilarious. All right, so there's the crew. Oh, yeah, there he is playing guitar. Um, all right. So what I want to look at here is how the Orville cloaks bias to create cognitive dissonance. All right? Uh, let's look at some specific ample examples to see how it does this. So episode three, you guys are about to come up to this one. Oh, good. Okay. So in episode three about a girl, Bordas and Clyden, the male couple, right? They have a baby, and it turns out to be a girl in this all-male species. Supposedly, this happens only once every 75 years, right? So they ask Dr. Finn to change the baby's gender because they have an all-male society. They can't tolerate a female in the society. Common procedure on Mockless is done all the time, right? To, well, well, common procedure, it's only once in 75 years, but it would be instantaneous. Like, that would be easy to do. On Mockless, it would be uncontroversial, is what I mean, right? But she refuses. Dr. Finn's is like, being female is not a disease. I only treat disease, right? So, 
They get in an argument. But eventually, Bordas changes his mind. And we'll talk about why he changes his mind in a little bit. But his husband, Clyden, does not. Clyden revo- re- reveals that he's not going to change his mind because he was born female and changed to a male. Right? And it's like, but our, and our daughter will be shunned by our society. There'll be no place for her. Right? So, a trial ensues on Moklis. They go to Moklis and a trial happens where they're trying to argue uh, with the Mocklin society that the sex change should not happen. Kelly argues that being born female is not a disability and therefore should not be rectified by surgical pr- procedure. It is revealed that Moklis' greatest author, Gandis Eldon, is actually a pseudonym, a pen name, for a female. And so that the greatest author on the planet is actually female. Um, everyone's stunned, of course, t- to learn this. But then in this... I won't say wonderful because it's a tragic ending, but like you would never see this on any other show. They lose the trial and they do the sex change. The girl is changed to a boy at the end. Right? Despite the fact that the father was opposed to it and everybody else was opposed to it, the biases win, right? The social forces and biases win and they change the little girl to a boy. Right? The episode's beautiful and it raises a number of philosophical issues. For example, one of my favorite scenes, moral relativism versus moral realism. The Bachlands consider being female a disability. Is this a cultural practice that should be tolerated or an unethical tradition that should be opposed? So, Ed, I've never seen anything on network television address this so freaking directly. Ed, I'm just policing myself because we all know how easy it is to judge another's cultures or way of life just because it's alien to us. Kelly, but you have to balance that against some kind of universal code of ethics. I mean, suppose it was their custom to kill all newborn females. Should we just respect their culture then? Beautiful. It comments on the common misconception of female inferiority. So in the trial, Kelly asks Gordon questions. I'm talking about up here. Ask Gordon's questions in the trial to show that men aren't necessarily more intelligent than than women. And she just asks him some basic questions, and he has no idea what he's talking about. For example, uh, one of the things she asks is, uh, what was the capital of the American American nation uh, known as the United States? What was its nation's capital? And he says, "Uh, Nabisco? (laughs) <laughs> um, just not very bright, right? And then there's this wonderful scene where Bordas, who clearly is a very strong, he's a part of an all-male species, fights Alora, right, the Salean, and she kicks his ass, right? Literally punches him out of the ring, right? And so it's this beautiful kind of commentary on the common misconception of female inferiority. It suggests that a, what a world would look like without women. The entire planet of Machlis, which is all-male, is a polluted industrial mess dedicated to military and weapons manufacturing. America, right? Like, it's, it's awful, right? Like, everything's just devoted to military. It's just, it's polluted, awful. That's what it looks like, right? It's a beautiful commentary on that. And it actually uses the create, a cloak bias to create cognitive dissidence method in the plot itself. Bordas changes his mind about changing the sex of his, or the gender of his, uh, of his child because he watches the claymation Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> Right? That's what they were bringing the beer in for before. They sit down and watch, and he sees, oh, what's considered a birth defect could actually be this wonderful thing that comes to serve everyone and make the world a better place. We have no idea what our daughter being female would actually do for her and what, what adventures lie ahead for her and what it could do. Right? And so he changes his mind because he watches this story that he has no preconceptions about and then learns this lesson that changes his view about the world. Right? Beautiful. That's why the little... Little boy at the end is holding a little Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer doll uh, before. So the viewer sides with the crew and Bordas. It's wrong for Clyden to force gender, the, the, force the gender of his and his society's choice on the child. The revelation, indeed, this is a little uh, kind of a little side note, but the revelation that Cliven was female too and he was changed, and that the female author, and the, the fact that the author that everyone thought was male was actually born female seems to suggest that the Mocklins aren't actually an all-male society. They are simply, they simply genetically alter all of their female children to be males because being female has become taboo in their society. And so they have this veneer of being all-male, but they're actually not. Females are born all the time, but no one ever knows about it because they're just secretly changed to male. Right? 
But then one realizes that this is directly analogous to what we often do with our own children, right? Not only is sexual preference, uh, for example, parents forcing a homosexual child to be straight, not only is that common, but we do this with gender itself, a society that forces those with abnormal sexuality to conform to one role or the other, right? So if it's wrong for Clyden to force Topa to be a boy, then it's wrong for a parent to force an intersex child to be male or female. Types of intersex children include being born with male or female gen uh, born with male and ge uh, female genitalia, like Christine uh, Christiane Voling. Uh, you could have amb ambiguous genitals, ambiguous internal organs, uh, XY male chromosome but the appearance of a woman, or XX female chromosomes and the appearance of a man. These are all things that happen in our society. If it's possible to be born that way, it's acceptable to live that way. It should be acceptable to live that way, right? That seems to clearly be the lesson of the Orville but it's trying to apply that lesson, trying to re make us realize that lesson ourselves and apply it to the real world. Indeed, what the Mocklins do suggest that while sex is genetic, gender might be more of a social construct than we're, than we're willing to admit, right? And so it has this, just the third episode, has this beautiful lesson about gender. Now exactly, see? One, one convert so far, all right. So let's look at another episode, that's the third episode. Let's look at another, another episode. <laughs> How am I doing on time? Uh, with Q&A, you've got another half hour. Okay, good. All right. If the star should appear. In this episode, the crew discovers a giant broken down bio ship with a population of millions living in an artificial biodome. So here's the dome and there's like a whole ecosystem that's under it. It's dr the ship is drifting and will be destroyed by a star in six months. It's going to drift into a star and be destroyed in six months. Turns out... The dome's inhabitants don't know they're on a ship. And a religion has developed which denies the existence of anything outside the dome. And they worship the word of Dural, who proclaims this to be true. This religion is protected by a dictatorial theocracy, although there are some reformers who do fight back. The crew tries to warn the society about their impending doom, but since the danger lies outside the dome, the warning is considered heresy, and all evidence is ignored. Not until they open the sunroof, exposing the biodome to the night sky for the first time, do they actually believe that something exists outside the dome, and thus that they actually are in danger. So there's the episode. The irrationality of denying the evidence is obvious, and the religious ignorance is irritating in the episode. Right? So, for example, a nice uh, uh, a scene here. Tomlin says, we have to take the crew to the city to show everyone. They'll have to accept it then because they're all dressed like this. Right? And so they'll have to accept that they're coming from outside the world. Kemka says, really, Tomlin? How well did that work with your mother and father? Did they accept it? They didn't. The concept of a beyond has been heresy throughout all of recorded history. People don't alter, uh, alter their beliefs easily. Dr. Finn replies, well, they're going to have to if they want to stay alive. If this ship drifts into that star, your whole world is going to fry. Why would anyone ignore this when there's a chance to stop it? Many people refuse to accept a refutable truth simply because that truth puts them in the wrong. We're later in the episode. Himlack, he's the religious leader uh, uh, and political leader of, of, it, of the entire society. To do as you say would be to shatter our entire way of life. This world is not ready, he says. Ed, you mean you're not ready to give up control of these people? What part of you're going to die, don't you understand, Finn replies. Ed presents the evidence of the outside world and shows them shows shows everything undeniably. Himlack, I will not destabilize a system that has kept order for thousands of years. The biodome inhabitants don't admit the truth until they open the sunroof and expose them to the stars in the outside world for the first time. But then one realizes that this is exactly what we have done with climate change. We have denied the evidence because it would prove us wrong and destabilize a system, fossil fuel energy and, and capitalism, which has kept order for decades despite the fact that if unchecked, it will end our civilization. We are just as stupid as the people in the biodome. And we've done so motivated and through the excuse of religion. We have used religion to deny this scientific truth and this threat to our entire civilization. You guys probably already know this, right? Religious denials of climate change 
John Shimkus, from Republican from Illinois, after quoting the flood narrative of Genesis to block a bill that would curb carbon emissions, the earth will end only when God declares it's time to be over. Man will not destroy this earth. This earth will not be destroyed by a flood. I do believe that God's word is infallible, unchanging, perfect. Tim Wahlberg, Republican from Michigan. As a Christian, I believe that there is a creator in God who is much bigger than us, and I'm confident that if there's a real problem with the climate, he can take care of it. Scott Pruitt, Trump's former EPA director, Republican from Oklahoma, condemning regulations that would protect the environment. The biblical worldview with respect to these issues is that we have a responsibility to manage and cultivate, harvest the natural resources that we've been blessed with to truly bless our fellow humankind. Studies show a direct link between Christian evangelicalism and denial of anthropogenic climate change and the dangers it poses, the only greater political predictor is political affiliation, right? Which, of course, goes with evangelicalism anyway, right? We are just as dumb as the people in the biodome. This realization can lead one to admit that they have been irrational to deny the evidence for climate change. Indeed, one wishes that we were as amendable to the evidence as those in the biodome. Our sunroof has already been opened. Right? The sufficient evidence of global warming, more than sufficient to produce climate change, has been around for years. The trend is clear with the hottest years in recorded history being 2014, 15, 16, and 17 consecutively, and then 18 is going to be included in the top five as well. Right? Our sunroof is already open. We've already seen the stars, and yet we still deny that they're there. It's depressing. I know. I'm sorry. This episode also provides some commentary on religion, too. Isaac, when they're talking about the religion of the society, the common impulse of biological life forms to attribute the origin of the universe to an omnipotent being is most curious. On the subnuclear scale, it is quite natural for quantum fluctuations to create matter where none exists. I gave a whole talk on that here a few years ago, right? Himalak, in a scene reminiscent of the Inquisition, incites a crowd to kill a reformer merely because of his beliefs. So there's commentary on the kind of the dangers of religion too. Well, this commentary continues in another episode called Krill. Defending a colony of, from the Union, the crew destroys a Krill vessel, Krill's an alien life form, and recovers a shuttle. Disguised as Krill, Ed and Gordon infiltrate a Krill vessel to gather intelligence about their religion, learn about their deity Avis, and obtain a copy of their Bible called the Ancana. But some less than savory things are revealed about the Krill religion. So Admiral Os Oswada, again, women in the, in the universe, almost all the admirals we've seen so far, not all of them, but a lot of them are women. Um, Azrael Oswana says, generally when a civilization becomes more technologically advanced, their adherence to religion declines. But the Krill are the exception, or an exception. They're, they've clung fiercely to their faith, even into the age of interstellar travel. All we know of their religion is that it places the Krill people above all other forms of life. When they attack a colony for their resources, they don't see it as an evil act. It's their divine right. Kelly says, ah, God created plants and animals solely for the use of man. Admiral, we can't reason with them. And if we went to war, they'd see it as a holy crusade which means it could last decades, right? So they're seeing this Krill religion uh, as dangerous. In the Krill worship services, they mutilate severed human heads. The Ankana is, in, in the Ankana says, it says, that which is not of Krill is without soul. So it dehumanizes or desouls them, says that they're not worthy. Of course, their god is named after a car rental company, and they make a few jokes about that. And then they plan to destroy a human colony to test a planet devastating weapon. And so the religion is clearly dangerous. All the worst aspects of religion are called forth here, right? So it's reminding us of our own, the dangers of our own religion. The Crusades, right? Manifest destiny. Environmental exploitation. Racism, right? And it is clearly, this episode is clearly a commentary on the dangers of our own religion uh, in our own society. This trend about the dangers of religion continues in another episode called Mad Idolatry. So a landing party accidentally happens upon a Bronze Age world. I didn't even mean to go down to it. It's a kind of a long story, about, not a long story, but they get there on accident. And then this Bronze Age world, in this Bronze Age world, First Officer Kelly happens upon some natives, and a little girl is injured running for her. So she scares the little girl, the little girl falls down. So she heals her with a medical device, and some other natives see her do this. They have to leave and later return but due to 700 years of temporal slippage, another sci-fi thing that's pretty unique here, caused by the planet's multiphasic orbit, 
The society has already progressed 700 years, and they're on to medieval times. And so, right, so 700 years ago, she heals the girl. They have to go away. They come back. 700 years have passed. Now they're in medieval times from the Bronze Age, and they see that Kelly is now worshipped as a deity, right, complete with beautiful stained glass windows, <laughs> right? She sees children scolded and threatened, like, if you don't behave, Kelly's going to get you, right? She sees people strung up because they've denied the word of Kelly. She sees criminals tried by bleeding, all in her name. And so she's horrified. She tries to undo it, so she goes to the space pope, essentially, right? She goes to the, the leader of this religion and tries to explain who they are, where they're from, how the device works, and all that kind of stuff. So he's even able to do it on himself, cuts his hand, heals it with the device, right? And it turns out that he's actually convinced. We have to let everybody know the truth. But another religious leader standing behind him there decides that he's not ready to let go of power, kills the space pope and takes power himself to keep the people in check. And so they return after another 700 years, and by now this society is into the equivalent of the 21st century. And televangelists of Kelly are bilking people out of money. <laughs> Worship, oh, so there's another, there's a mega church, there's a mega church of Kelly right there. Worship of Kelly is corrupting education, so this is some people on a local news thing debating the role of, of Kelly worship in, 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 uh, in, in education. And of course, there are religious conflicts that are killing millions, right? All in the name of Kelly, and she's horrified. But more than 700 years later, they come back again, and the society advances past the planetary union and is one of peace and prosperity. But not because of the word of Kelly, despite it. So there's the advanced ships. Uh, they look very much uh, like the Union. And two members of this society come and visit them, right? Uh, interestingly, all the people that we saw in the early versions were all white. And then these are the people that visit in the advanced, uh, in the advanced version of the society that's advanced beyond the Union. And they sit down, and here's a great quote from the episode. Our world advanced just as it would have. We wouldn't have gotten to where we are without growing pains. Our planet worshipped you as a deity for many centuries, but had it not been you, the mythology would have, would have found just another face. It's a part of every culture's evolution. It's one of the stages of learning. You see, Commander, you didn't poison our culture with false faith. We flourish. You must have faith in reason in discovery. You must have faith in reason in discovery and in the endurance of the logical mind. So they're like, you don't really need to worry about corrupting us. The religion wouldn't have taken any form. It's just an inevitable hurdle. Religion is an inevitable hurdle to the eventual progress beyond it to a society that is peaceful and prosperous. Right? Again, beautiful commentary on religion. The episode thinly cloaks bias to create cognitive dissonance. The similarity to Christianity and all major religions is obvious and makes the moral clear. Religion is an unavoidable pitfall, something that we must get beyond so that we can embrace reason and logic if we are to advance and prosper. Make sense? All right? Beautiful show, right? Another topic is addressed in Cupid's Dagger. The blue alien that Kelly cheated with is back. Derulio is back. And he comes back to help with, with the mission. And it turns out that Derulio is Rob Lowe, right? So Rob Lowe plays the kind of sexy and, and kind of fun alien. Uh, Kelly says that there's nothing between them, but then she kind of falls for him again, right? And then Ed walks in on them again, right? So Ed's about to fire Derulio from his position on the mission, and then Ed suddenly falls in love with him too. Seems odd. And at the same time, here's the answer to your question, Jason. Others in the show seem to start showing similar reactions, right? They start showing attractions to people that normally they wouldn't show attractions to, right? So this has been in Yafit, getting it on. Um, Ed and Kelly fight between themselves over who should sleep with Derulio and be with them, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it turns out that Derulio species emits a pheromone once a year that produces a chemically induced feeling in those he touches that makes the bear irresistible, right? 
They end up using this to stop a war. So these two are part of a species that were about to go to a giant war and their entire civilization was going to be decimated. They used Derulio's love potion, as it were, to make them fall in love and the war stops. Derulio was actually aware of this, but decided not to tell anyone until he realized he was causing a war because Kelly and Ed were so distracted they couldn't broker a peace between the two, right? This, uh, let me just put it this way. My colleagues and I argued over an hour about whether Derulio's pheromone was equivalent to a date rape, date rape drug. <laughs> right? On the one hand, it doesn't knock people out, and some date rape, date, date rape drugs do that, but date rape drugs don't always do that. They also can impair judgment and make one suggestible. So is that what Derulio's doing? But they don't create genuine desire, and Derulio's pheromone does create genuine desire. There's actually some lines in the show where he says, no, no, their feelings are real. They really are in love with me. Right? So if not... If, they, if, it, if, it, if, it really was, if it really, well, I guess there could be debate about whether it really is genuine, right? If not, they may have been letting him off way too easy, letting Rob Lowe's character Derulio off. They really should have been after him because he's basically raping people, right, with this pheromone of his, right? But if it does really create genuine desire, it may not be that different than conceptual sex. After all, love is just kind of a chemically induced feeling, right? Um, kind of a chemically induced madness in a certain kind of way, right? I'm going to let you decide what you think about this because it's really, really hairy and difficult and how it might affect your views about the related issues, but you can see how the show was doing exactly what I'm saying sci-fi does best, right? Raise these philosophical issues and force us to think about them. Let, let's look at one last episode. So there's John Lamar drinking his soda on the bridge. Um, ah, this is the one I cover in the, in the course. Majority rule. The Orville discovers a 21st century level planet that is ruled by a pure democracy, not a representative democracy, a pure democracy, everything Guilt or innocence, the safety of medications, the truth and falsity of studies, or the truth and falsity of claims are all decided by majority vote. Everyone wears a badge that indicates how much they are liked or whether they are good or evil. So if you do something that someone likes, you just go up and click the up button. If they, if they do something you don't like, you click the down button and you can vote online. If enough people down vote you for some kind of violation, you have to go on a public apology tour. So in the episode... Lamar is kind of making a joke, and he grind dances on the statue. Well, it turns out the statue is of a founding member of this society, and so it's very disrespectful. It goes viral. If enough votes go against you, there's the apology tour. So he has to go on an apology tour to get less down votes. But if enough vote against you, you're essentially lobotomized so that you will never do such a horrible thing again. And voting takes place on what's called the master feed a live streaming worldwide chat service. So this beautiful conversation ensues. Lysella is a, is a member of the community they bring up to the ship to try to help them. So Lamar is in trouble, right? Lamar does this grind dance, he gets in trouble, has to go on apology tour, he's gonna to be lobotomized if he gets more than, than 10 million votes. So they bring her up to, to help. Lysella says, well, everybody deserves a, a voice, that's what we're taught. Bordas, a voice should be earned, not given away. How do you know what foods are healthiest for your children or what medicines to take if you're sick? We vote. I believe you are confusing opinion with knowledge, Isaac says. Alara, what he means is, with so many voices, how do you filter out the truth? Lysela says, well, my dad always says the majority are the truth. I mean, you always know what the majority wants. That's what matters. Well, you always know what the mob wants, too, says Ed. Right? And so here's the clip I want to show you. So what they do, what they decide to do, they need to save Lieutenant Lamar. Lamar is um, Lamar's about to be lobotomized. They need to keep him under a certain number of votes. And so what they decide to do, can everybody see that? Uh-oh. Oh, I, I know what to do. I know what to do. Boom. Duplicate. Now can you see it? There we go. Just hit escape and then the thing will go. There we go. Perfect. All right, so they're trying to... So they are trying to uh, save Lamar, and what they're going to do is hack the feed. We're running out of time. Stand by. Isaac, what's your status? I have gained access to the master feed. All right, Lucella, what kind of stuff would endear him to your people? Um, you could say he supports his grandmother financially. Do it. But make sure you word it right. Like, say, oh my god, I just found out John Lamar supports his 90 year old grandmother. Flooding the feed with 20 million entries. How can you do that? Okay, stay here. Our glass. If he was an overweight kid, that would help. 
Access childhood image of John. Great oh, right, job, Isaac. Can you make him fatter? <laughs> Flooding the feed with the image. The entries are spreading and multiplying. People are sharing them. What if people try to corroborate all this information? Don't worry, they won't. <laughs> Final thoughts begin. shows that a, a, a society that relies on these kinds of ideas of communication, that allows information, that kind of stuff, to be democratized, as it were, to not rely on experts, is easily hackable, right? I mean, you need people to kind of do whatever you want by flooding the master feed with fake news. My, my, favorite, my favorite moment is this, what if they try to corroborate this evidence? She's like, oh, don't worry. <laughs> Nobody checks in, right? The masterpiece, obviously, Facebook and Twitter, the moral Facebook and Twitter, uh, facilitate unjust trial by mob and spread false news and information about files. We should just turn them off. That should basically be So, my conclusion is this, and then we'll take some questions. Because it cloaks bias to create cognitive dissonance better than anything else, I think the Orville is the most important sci fi on, on TV today. A close second would be The Handmaid's Tale or Black Mirror, which are both really good shows. Both of them, oh, sorry, both of them are covered uh, in, um, in, the, in my sci fi course. But Handmaid's Tale, uh, The Handmaid's Tale, although, although The Handmaid's Tale, I'm like thinking of the T there for some reason, criticizes an attitude current among religious fundamentalists, it, it kind of takes an entire series to do this, and it's only kind of addressing one topic, whereas the Orville is doing multiple topics, right? Black Mirror does address many topics and warns us about the effects of t technology, but it's much harder to decipher. I'm finding this out as I'm editing the book on Black Mirror. Um, it's very much it's very hard to, much harder to decipher. Whereas the Orville is plain and straightforward, and the moral is very clear, and it's definitely getting its message across. Um, the Orville is doing something very different and obvious every episode, unlike these two shows. So that's why I think Orville's just a little bit better. Although I love both of these shows. Uh, so again, if you enjoyed this, if you like this kind of approach to science fiction, 
My course, Sci-Fi, Science Fiction, is Philosophy, is right up your alley. Feel free to talk to me about it afterwards. But let's take some questions. Uh, what, do you, what do you think? I was wondering, have you ever encountered situations where people have declared that they've changed their ideologies one way or another because of influence of science fiction? So I can count myself in that. I've changed my views in that way. Uh, and in fact, science fiction informs the kind of person I am because Spock was a huge influence on me as a kid. Um, other than that, I can also cite examples of uh, another one here. Good. Um, and, uh, uh, but other than that, in my students, definitely. Right? Uh, I teach this kind of stuff in, in courses and stuff like that. And I mean, maybe it's the sci fi that's doing it, maybe it's the philosophical arguments that we you know, consider and that kind of stuff. Uh, but um, yeah, most definitely. I mean, I, I think that people underestimate um, the effect that, like, it's so easy to look at these things and just say, oh, it's just a story, it's just sci fi, what, you know, what's the big deal or whatever. Movies and television shows change people's lives, right? They will. Um, I was listening to it. Starship Troopers is one of the things that I cover in, in the course, right? And it's actually anti-fascist, but if you don't get the satire, like, recruitment went up after Starship Like, there were people who, en who enrolled in the military after seeing Starship Troopers not understanding the satire, right? Uh, that's, I mean, that's a big life decision, right? Because you saw a damn movie, right? So, most definitely, yeah, although I can't give you any more specific examples than that, but, yeah. I don't know anyone who jumped up and said, oh, my whole you know, view of things has changed now. But I have known people who very clearly, as they were reading or watching something, were seeing people of other species as being valid you know, entities that right. deserve to have attention. And, and I, I can't help but think that that's got to be a positive. Oh, absolutely. If you can think it and feel it um, in, a, in a story, I think you begin to think and feel it on, in life, even if you're not thinking you are. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely, right. Uh, and, and just to mention two more examples, uh, this is old Star Trek again, uh, but first interracial kiss on television was on Star Trek between Uhura and Kirk. Interesting, it was first going to be Uhura and Spock, but it turned out to be Uhura and Kirk. Um, and then this one, this one impacted me as a, as a young boy in Oklahoma. There's a, an episode called Your Last Battlefield, where they come across an alien species that's white on one side and, right, and, and, and black on the other, right? And there's this beautiful moment in the, in the show where, so you have these two aliens, they're black on one side, white one on the other, and they hate each other. They cannot stand each other, right? And it, and it turns out that there's this, like, I hate them. Their, their kind is awful. And they're like, what do, you, what do you mean their kind? You're the same. It's like, what do you mean? Haven't you looked at him? It's like, yeah, he's, right on, he's white on the right and black on the left. He's, no, no, he's, he's white and black. He says, no, 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 no. He's white on the right. We are black on the right. Right? And that's the distinction that they make between the two. And that's why he hates them. It's because he's white on the wrong side. Right? And literally, like Kirk and Spock look at him like, we literally did not notice. Right? We did not notice this difference between the two of you. Right? Um, and... As a kid growing up in Oklahoma, right, that, that affected me too. It's like, oh, maybe color doesn't matter, right? And it, it has this, anyway, go, go ahead. Who else has a question? For the record, all in the family gave me my political beliefs. All, all in the family did? Gave your political beliefs? Yeah. Which side? <laughs> <laughs> which which <laughs> Meathead, of course. Okay, okay. <laughs> I was always on his side. So um, I noticed that you use the Hunger Games and... Um, Elysium in that, in that. Yeah, and also The Handmaid's Tale in oh, yeah. there. And I'm kind of hung up on this. Uh, they're not really considered sci-fi. They're more oh, dystopian. Sure. Right. So that's, I, I wondered if you could clarify that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, in the very first lecture, I basically say... We could spend a whole course talking about what the definition of science fiction is and figure out what should be included and what shouldn't and da 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 right? The definition I use in the course is, what's his name? I forget the name of the philosopher who says it. His definition is, science fiction is whatever we point to when we say it. So I kind of hedge, I just kind of like surpass that. It's like, I'm going to call sci-fi wherever I want to call sci-fi with any kind of, you know, within, within reason. If anybody calls it sci-fi and I want to cover it, I'm going to cover it. Some people call Handmaid's Tale science fiction uh, because it's set in the future. Because it's it's like 1984, and 1984 is sci-fi, right? It's a dystopian future. Um, 
it's hard to point to a specific piece of technology that's advanced beyond us and say that's what makes it sci-fi. There's a couple of examples in The Handmaid's Tale that you might mention, um, but Handmaid's Tale's so good, I just ignored all that. It's like, we're gonna do it anyway. Uh, same thing with, I think it's easier to make a case for The Hunger Games being sci-fi, because there's, it's set in the future and there's some advanced technology and that kind of stuff that's, that's involved there. Uh, especially like with the, you know, the, in the first one where they have the digital representations of the, all the fallen tributes, right, come back as monsters and stuff. That's more sci-fi-ish, but um, The Handmaid's Tale Lecture is one of my favorites. I learned so much about that one. Um, I argue that Atwood has actually said that her work is not feminist. And in the first, my first lecture is about authorial intent and the way it influences the meaning of stuff, a meaning of, of works of art, right? And I take the non-intentionalist stance and say that you can't let an authorial intention define the meaning of a work. And Atwood has said that it's not feminist. I argue that it is. Uh, and I basically lay out the three waves and how it endorses ideas from all three and da, da, da. But. Speaking of all in the family, was the racist yet lovable robot designed over Archie Bunker at he's, all? He's, he doesn't come across that way. That's okay. the thing. Is like He just thinks artificial intelligence is superior to biological because they're faster at everything, right? They're, you know, they're smarter and da 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 But he's not a jerk. He doesn't like throw it in everyone's face. He's there to facilitate relations between the two. And so he just, he just says things like, you will find me to be your most capable officer, right? Uh, and uh, I will be glad to do this thing and I will do it with, with, with abandon and you know, I'll do it better than anybody else or whatever. But he doesn't, he's not a jerk. He doesn't come across as a jerk. He's actually one of my favorite characters. In the episode where they, uh, they have the planet that skips every 700 years, they try to undo it by, in the 21st century, sending Isaac down, and he lives 700 years, and then comes back with them after 700 years. Like, he lives 700 years on that planet. Um, and does fine, right? Like, uh, but anyway. Anybody already have their hand up? The food is here. Yeah, let's come over to Richard, and then uh, you'll be sticking around. Oh, absolutely. Yes. So if anybody else wants to ask questions, just hang out. So uh, you're supposed to make one comment. If, if you would count this, count this one. I have four. Okay. First one is, uh, we, Martha and I listened to your uh, lecture series. When we, when we do questions? And we just like it. Oh, thank you very much. We just like it, like it, like it. Thank you. Okay. Number two, um, uh, we enjoyed the show. We got copies last night, and we enjoyed that. Uh, number three... Uh, oh, we've been married 50 years, and there's one thing that she's never forgiven me for, even though uh -oh. there have been many forgivenesses. Okay. And that was, before I met her, I had about eight or 9,000 science fiction books, inc including every single issue of the galaxy and astonishing, mm -hmm. and she will say to me, and you got rid of them all. And that's it. She'll just say, you got rid of the ball. <laughs> that is an unforgivable <laughs> sin. <laughs> <laughs> so what's number four? Uh, I really enjoyed this show. And quite frankly, we, we really are enjoying New Herbal. So. Great. Thank you Thank very you. much. All right. Well, I'll be sticking around. Uh, live long and prosper. Kyle, and, thank uh, you very much. Thank you. All right.